Today, science is on the threshold of a new era, an era that will change the world dramatically. Laboratories the world over are turning to revolutionary new tools and methods to diagnose illness, to cure disease, to grow food, and to dispose of waste. This exciting new field of discovery is called biotechnology. And many of these innovative scientists are learning to manipulate the essence of life. One tool scientists use in their quest to understand the mechanisms of life is the electron microscope, which can magnify a tiny cell 100,000 times or more. To begin, a thin layer of cells is placed on a copper grid and stained. Dr. Ross Inman of the University of Wisconsin then carefully inserts the grid into the microscope and is ready to explore the hidden world within the cell. For decades, scientists have searched for answers to key questions. How is it possible that all the information needed to build a living thing exists within a single cell? If skin, eyes, brain, and blood all develop from one cell, how is so much information stored in such a tiny space? The answers lie within these long, thin, twisted strands. Chromosomes are composed mainly of a complex molecule called deoxyribonucleic acid, or DNA. Each chromosome is really two strands of DNA twisted around each other. Dr. Linus Pauling, one of the pioneers of the study of molecular structure and winner of the Nobel Prize in Chemistry, describes the structure of DNA. The DNA molecule, the gene, consists of two polynucleotides which are twisted around one another and which are mutually complementary. If we examine DNA closely, we find that the two twisted strands are connected chemically. Like rungs in a ladder, four different chemical bases link the two strands together. The precise order of the bases along the chain tells a very important story. Either one of these two chains could be the prescription for a human being or the collection of all of the chains, all of the genes that the human being has inherited from his father and his mother, perhaps a, a hundred thousand altogether. They are the prescription for the development of that human being. And the, the prescription is written in a language that has four letters, A for adenine, T for thymine, G for guanine, and C for cytosine. This is something basic, the key we've been looking for. These four letters represent the genetic code of life. Deciphering the code was a major breakthrough for science. This has been an extraordinary development. It is one of the most important discoveries that has ever been made about the nature of life. All living organisms use this same basic code. Whether a cell develops to become a tree or a child is spelled out here. To better understand the nature of life, scientists have sought better ways to visualize DNA. Dr. Robert Langridge of the University of California pioneered the use of computer graphics as a tool in molecular biology. The computer's three-dimensional views help him see how molecules would fit together. His use of the computer will assist in the design of new medicines. Dr. Langridge uses the computer as a tool to manipulate DNA in the abstract. Other scientists isolate DNA itself. In a now common laboratory procedure, ethanol is added to a solution of ruptured cells. This causes DNA to precipitate out. It can then be spooled up onto a glass rod. Once scientists knew how to isolate strands of DNA, 
they learn to cut them into segments. They use a kind of chemical scissors called restriction enzymes to cut the DNA into fragments. The fragments can then be loaded into tiny wells in a thin agar gel and then separated using a weak electrical current. The shorter the DNA fragment, the farther it travels across the gel. Under ultraviolet light, the individual pieces of treated DNA glow brightly. A technician finds the piece of DNA she wants and carefully cuts it out. Since the mid-1970s, using techniques like these, biotechnologists have learned to isolate specific fragments of DNA or genes and then transfer them to entirely different plants or animals. They can now combine the most desirable characteristics of two different species into the offspring. The process works like this. Scientists begin with a cell from one organism. In one of the chromosomes is a gene they are interested in isolating. They put the cell in solution. The cell wall ruptures. The chromosomes spill out. Molecular biologists then use restriction enzymes to cut the gene of interest out of the chromosome. The scientists can then transfer the gene to another organism. One organism commonly used because it is well understood is a bacterium called Escherichia coli. In addition to having its own chromosomes, E. coli, like most other bacteria, have small loops of DNA called plasmids. Scientists can remove a plasmid, cut it apart, and then chemically glue the selected gene into the plasmid. The plasmid can be put back into the bacterium, which will go on living its life, duplicating itself. But with one important difference, each new bacterial cell now contains genetic information from two organisms. If scientists splice a human gene into the bacterial plasmid, the new generation of E. coli will be able to make a human protein. This basic technique of genetic engineering has many applications. At Eli Lilly and Company in Indianapolis, the first genetically engineered drug approved for human use is being produced. Here, scientists isolate the portion of the human genetic information that regulates blood sugar. They take the human genes, insert them into E. coli, and use that genetically engineered bacterium to produce a human protein, insulin. A technician is spreading the altered bacteria onto a medium. In order not to contaminate the sample, he's working at a lab station with an overhanging ventilated hood. Given time, the E. coli will reproduce, forming a number of individual colonies. The technician chooses a single colony, which will become the parent of an entire batch of insulin. To make enough human insulin for commercial purposes, Eli Lilly must encourage the bacteria to duplicate themselves many millions of times. As the culture grows, it is transferred to larger and larger containers, ultimately reaching computer-controlled fermentation tanks. When production is complete, the insulin is chemically separated from the E. coli, purified, quality tested, made into a solution in huge vats, and then under sterile conditions, bottled for sale. There is a growing demand worldwide for insulin to treat diabetes, which can be a fatal disease. 
Of the nearly two million diabetics in the United States who use insulin, most are treated with insulin derived from pigs and cattle. But some patients can't tolerate the animal hormone. For them, the genetically engineered human insulin is an advantage. Hello. Hi. Hi. How are you today? Just fine. Yeah, good to see Hi. you. Yeah. How you doing, Joe? Pretty good. Yeah. Have you been having any Joe problems? Loper of Corvallis, Oregon, is one such patient. Mm, about 15 regular, 25 NPH. Mm -hmm. It's going pretty well for you? Mm -hmm. Have you been having any kind of reactions with it? Mm, it's off and on, not really. Uh-huh. Have you noticed any problems that he's been having? Or? Occasionally he will get a little uh, rash on a, on a thigh if he uses uh -huh. it too, too long in one area. Mm -hmm. Well, <clears throat> there's a new kind of insulin that has been recently developed, and it is actually made from a bacteria. These bacteria have been sort of taught how to make human insulin. It's the very same kind of insulin that people have coming from their pancreases. And it's not an insulin that comes from pork or beef, which is what you've been using. Mm -hmm. And we're going to be changing the, you to this because I think it'll probably be better for your diabetes control. Other genetically engineered drugs are being developed and tested, including one called TPA, tissue type plasminogen activator. This drug may soon be widely available to treat one of society's greatest medical emergencies, the heart attack. Standing by, okay, Hi, 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 Heart attacks are our number one killer. They are usually caused by a blood clot, which blocks the flow of blood through the victim's heart. If the blood clot is not dissolved quickly enough, the heart may stop beating. TPA is a protein that is part of the body's normal mechanism to break up clots. In the near future, emergency medical teams may use genetically engineered TPA to boost the body's own defense mechanisms. Yeah. He's had five tenths of a milligram of atropine, which brought us right up to approximately 68 to 70, initially at uh, 40. Initial blood pressure was 60 by the location. After the atropine, we went up to 110 systolic. Has he been breathing on his own? He's uh, resisting the tube and attempting to take the breaths here. When a heart attack is in progress, a region of the heart muscle, the pumping chamber usually, is in jeopardy because it's not getting enough oxygen and blood. The blood is normally carried in a coronary artery to such a region, but that coronary artery may be blocked by clot, and so no blood can get by the clot into the heart muscle itself. One method that doctors use to examine patients with heart problems is coronary catheterization. For this common procedure, a patient is usually stable and alert. A catheter, a long hollow tube, is threaded up through one of the patient's large leg arteries to the heart itself. An X-ray machine is placed over his chest and a radioactive dye is injected through the catheter into the heart. A television screen connected to the X-ray machine shows the dye moving through the heart. In this way, the doctors can examine each coronary artery, one at a time, looking for blood clots. Okay. A little sharp? Yeah, a little. For a few moments after the dye has reached the heart, the arteries show up on the screen like bright white fingers. In this patient, a blood clot midway down the anterior coronary artery completely blocks blood flow. But this patient was lucky. 
He was part of a TPA testing program. TPA was administered immediately, and an hour later, the clot had dissolved. Blood flow was restored to the lower two-thirds of the artery, and the patient survived. The TPA we're now using is made by recombinant DNA technology. That technology offers many specific advantages. The first, perhaps the most important, is that it permits the production of a very uniform kind of material that won't cause unexpected toxic reactions. Uh, the second advantage is that it permits the production of a large amount of material so that one can think about using this as a drug for many hundreds of thousands of patients. And the third uh, is that it is giving rise to something that is a naturally occurring material in that the gene that's used to produce it is a human gene. The promise of genetic engineering extends beyond medicine. One area where the benefits to society may be especially great is agriculture. The idea of genetic selection in agriculture is not new. However, modern genetic engineering allows scientists to introduce desirable qualities into plants with greater precision. These scientists hope to be able to engineer new varieties of plants that will bear more fruit, better resist disease, and use less fertilizer than existing varieties. For example, at the Agrogenetics Corporation in Wisconsin, a major area of research involves helping soybeans to make some of their own fertilizer more efficiently. The benefits could be dramatic. The farmer could spend less on expensive chemical fertilizers and even increase his crop production. The soybeans in this incubator room are helped to grow by bacteria that live inside nodules on their roots. There, the bacteria transform nitrogen from the air into nitrogen that the plant can use. Researchers are attempting to improve the process by genetically engineering the nitrogen-fixing bacteria. Some believe it may be possible to introduce this desirable nitrogen-fixing trait into plants that have never had it. To introduce new genes into plants, the main technique that researchers use involves tissue culture, which allows an entire plant to be regenerated from a single cell. To prepare the host plant for the new gene, researchers cut a leaf into very fine pieces. The desired foreign gene, meanwhile, has been inserted into the plasmid of a special bacterium called agrobacterium. The agrobacterium is then mixed with the plant cells. The bacteria then put the desired foreign gene into the plant cell's DNA. Under carefully controlled conditions, the plant cells can then regenerate into whole plants that carry the new gene. Though the techniques of genetic engineering are new, they can be understood as a refinement of traditional plant breeding. Dr. Winston Brill of Agrocetus in Wisconsin explains. Uh, these two plants are involved in breeding programs that are going on around the world. This is normal corn, and this is a wild ancestor called Teosinte. These two can cross together. Teosinte has some characteristics that are potentially very valuable, such as certain disease resistances. So these two are crossed. When they cross, thousands and thousands of genes intermingle in some random manner, and nobody can really predict exactly what the plants from this cross will look like in the field. With genetic engineering, one can pluck out the gene for disease resistance from this plant and add it specifically to the corn plant. And you can see that genetic engineering is really a fine tuning of breeding. The potential of genetic engineering to benefit mankind is surely very great. 
we can expect genetic engineering to make far-reaching changes in all aspects of our lives. But some people fear these new technologies. They say we should not meddle with nature. The potential for harm does exist. But regulations have been established to minimize possible hazards. To date, no harmful effects have been observed. And today, most scientists consider this kind of research to be safe. Mankind now has the key to the code of life. This is a great challenge and a great responsibility. <laughs>